Um, but, you know, this is the day that the Lord has made. I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. <laughs> Even though my RAV didn't want to start today because the battery died. But we're going to have a good day. Regardless, it's always going to be a good day. Um, we're about to actually jump into a new series. And we're going to be talking about the, the main point of the messages. The, the lessons are going to be, who is God? We did, I am a Christian. We did, um, who am I? And now we're going to talk about who is God to fin- kind of finish out the year, go a little bit into the new year. Uh, I will be doing two lessons. Um, so hopefully you guys won't be bored to tears. Um, <laughs> I'll try not to be boring. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but this is the, the subject I'm going to be talking on today um, is going to be the oneness of God. It's something that, you know, if you've been here for a while, you've heard at some point and everything. But um, I really want to kind of drive home that Jesus is God and how really tying together how Jehovah of the Old Testament is Jesus, and vice versa, Jesus is Jehovah. I hope to equip equip everybody here with a fresh appreciation for the truth of the oneness doctrine. I also hope to make it a, make you be able to further solidify your faith and also trust in the truth of the oneness of God. When I say oneness of God, I'm speaking of specifically about the one true God. Before my next statement, let me preface it by stating emphatically that I am in absolutely no way do I mean to offend anybody. Um, if questions do arise, please come to me after the, the, you know, the lesson and everything, and I'm more than happy to, you know, talk with you and everything. I look forward to that. This is kind of my candy stick. I love it. So I would love to, to talk about that with you um, and everything. But today we are going to be dealing with that facet of the Godhead. It is one. Um, with that said, I want to make a bold and to some a possibly controversial statement. That statement is this. When I say the one true God, I am in zero ways referring to a God in three persons or Trinitarian form of belief, view of the God of the Bible. I'm speaking about an actually monotheistic, mono, everybody knows, means one, monotheistic view of the God of the Bible. Monotheistic means relating to or characterized by the belief that there's only one God. Many professing Christians today would say that they are indeed monotheistic, however, they are not in actuality. We are truly monotheistic because we believe The Bible speaks of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost as different manifestations, roles, modes, titles, attributes, relationships to man, or functions of the one God. But it does not refer to the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost as multiple persons, personalities, wills, minds, or gods individually. God is the Father of us all, and in a unique way, the Father of the man, Christ Jesus. God manifested himself in the flesh in the person of Jesus Christ called the Son of God. God is also called the Holy Spirit, which emphasizes his activity in the lives and affairs of mankind. God is not limited to these three manifestations, however. In the glorious revelation of the one God, the New Testament does not deviate from the strict monotheism of the Old Testament. Rather, the Bible presents Jesus as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Jesus is not just the manifestation of one of the three persons of the Godhead, but he is the incarnation of the Father, the Jehovah of the Old Testament. Truly in Jesus dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Jesus is everything that the Bible describes God to be. He has all, th- all the attributes, prerogatives, and characteristics of God himself. To put it simply, everything that God is, Jesus is. Jesus is the one God. In summary, there is one God who has revealed himself as Father through his Son in redemption and as the Holy Spirit by outpouring and action. Jesus Christ is God, manifested in the flesh. He is both God and man. 
God has revealed himself through manifestations or modes. All of what I just mentioned is based in Scripture. While we can use extra biblical methods to describe and prove this truth, we don't have to because unlike other beliefs, our foundation is Scripture. With that said, most of the Christian world ascribes to the Trinitarian view of the God of the Bible. Let's look at the definition of Trinitarian because it is the foremost um, idea of Christianity out there that is not truly monotheistic. What is the, the related, the Trinitarians, the definition of it is relating to the belief in the doctrine of the Trinity. So what is the doctrine of the Trinity? According to the Catechism of the, the Catholic Church, which has by far and away been around for the longest time and has the, <laughs> the most deep records of the Trinitarian belief of all time, the Christian doctrine of the Trinity defines one God existing in three co-equal, co-eternal, divine persons. God the Father, God the Son, Jesus Christ, and God the Holy Spirit. Two of those you don't see in Scripture, by the way. Three distinct persons sharing one essence. As the fourth Lateran Council declared, it is the Father who begets, this is again falling under their description of the Trinity, the Son who is begotten, and the Holy Spirit who brings out, about, I'm sorry. In this context, the three persons define who God is, while the one essence defines what God is. This expresses at the same time their distinction and their indissoluble unity. Thus, the whole work of creation and grace is seen as a single common operation of all three divine persons in which each manifests what is proper to it in the Trinity so that all things are from the Father, through the Son, and in the Holy Spirit. On the website DesiringGod.org, a website started by Dr. John Piper, who has a lot of great material. He's a very good speaker. He's a Baptist minister. Um, he describes it, the doctrine of the Trinity, as there is one God who eternally exists as three distinct persons, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Stated differently, God is one in essence and three in person. From other resources, speaking of the Trinity, it asserts that the three persons of the Godhead are, like we said, co-equal and co-eternal. It is also of note that according to Trinitarians, the three separate persons are believed to all and uh, each have an independent center of consciousness and determination while having a singular essence. Yeah, that, yep, uh-huh, that's as odd as it sounds. Again, I'm not trying to throw shade, that's just some things, it doesn't line up with the monotheistic, the one God view. My point for today and next week is not to have a one-person debate with the doctrine of the Trinity or any other multiplicity, but to show the true definition of monotheism. With the definitions laid, I would like to talk about the origin of belief in the one true God. In reality, the belief that God is one and undivided is not, unoriginal with the, is not original with the church, but comes from God's original chosen people, the Israelites or the Jews today. The Jews have always believed in one undivided God called Yahweh or Jehovah. Judaism is the world's oldest monotheistic religion, dating back nearly 4,000 years. Followers of Judaism believe in one God who revealed himself through ancient prophets. The history of Judaism is essential to understanding the Jewish faith, which has a rich heritage of law and tradition. But reality, the, the first Christians were Jews first. They were instructed from a very early age in the statutes and teachings of the Old Testament. As children, they were instructed to memorize the Bible. One of the ways that they committed Scripture to memory was by making certain passages into prayers. One such prayer is called the Shema. Anybody ever heard of the Shema? Hey, I knew Sister Allison would. While I was writing this, I was like, I know Sister Allison's got this. The Shema prayer is one of the most famous prayers found in the Bible. It's a daily prayer for the ancient Israelites and still recited by Jewish practitioners uh, today. The Shema is to be prayed every morning and evening by Jews. 
It goes as follows. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. The Shema continues on with additional verses, but the starting verse, which I just quoted in Hebrew, is something as Pentecostals we know very well. Deuteronomy 6.4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. That verse is the bedrock and definition that the true doctrine of the oneness of God is built upon. You may be asking, how does this Jewish prayer relate to us today as oneness Christians? Brothers and sisters, over the next few weeks, myself and other teachers are going to build the bridge from the Old Testament Jehovah to Jesus. Deuteronomy 6.4 has been quoted, but let me tie that to the New Testament with this verse. John chapter 10, verse 30. I and my Father are one. This is Jesus speaking. The word for one there is by, said by some to mean one in purpose. That ain't true. Let's add some context. Let's go to a couple verses before then. John 10, 23. And Jesus walked into the temple in Solomon's porch. Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you and ye believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Boom, verse 30. I and my Father are one. Being one in purpose does not line up with that definition there, especially when you see how the Jews react in the verses after verse 30. Then the Jews took stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, many good works have I showed you from my father. For which of these works do ye stone me? The Jews answered him saying, for a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. And because that thou being a man, makest thyself God. In the Jews' perspective, Jesus was not saying that he was one in purpose with God, but that he was God as evidenced by them literally calling him a blasphemer in verse 33. Jumping down to verse 36, we see a little bit of Jesus' response. Say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified, and send it to the world, thou blasphemous, because I said I am the Son of God. If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do, though ye believe not me, believe the works, that ye may know and believe that the Father is in me, and I in him. Verse 38 that we just read sounds really weird if the word one in verse 30 is meant to be purpose. That doesn't line up. How's this a bridge from the Old Testament to the New Testament? Especially to Jehovah. Well, because God, this, in that whole passage, Jesus was saying, I'm God. <laughs> when, you know, later on in a, in a different verse, once you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Because we know that in Isaiah chapter 42, in verse 8, it says, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory Will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images? We know that he doesn't share his glory. Let's continue in that vein by jumping to Acts chapter 3, verses 14 through 15. This is Peter talking about Jesus, saying, But he denied the Holy One and the just, and desired a murderer to be granted unto you, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses." Man, the Holy One and the just, that sounds like Peter's calling Jesus God. God said he doesn't share his glory like we just read. As an object lesson found in the New Testament that God still doesn't share his glory, we can jump down to Acts chapter 12 and read verses 21 through 23. And upon a set day, Herod arrayed in royal apparel sat upon his throne 
and made an oration unto them. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of a God, not a man. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him, because he gave not God the glory. And he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. As a side note, that's pretty gnarly. He didn't die right away. It says that he gave up the ghost after the worms started eating him. Take that mental picture with you. (laughs) Going back to Acts chapter 3, verses 14 through 15, where it calls Jesus the Holy One. I was reading in in, uh, the wonderful Bible that my wife got me on our wedding day. She gave me that Bible. In the margins of that Bible, it says that the Holy One, uh, used in verse 14, ties back to Mark chapter 1, verse 24, which says, saying, let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. This is the voice of a demon-possessed man. In the margins of that verse, it ties that Holy One back to Psalm chapter 16, verse 10, which says, for thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine Holy One to see corruption. The Hebrew word there used for Holy One It's only used one time for that particular phrase. It's pronounced kossid. The only time that that word is used for that is in that scripture passage. Is it possible that Psalms chapter 16 verse 10 is a messianically prophetic verse in reference to Jesus the Messiah's time after being on the cross down in hell getting the keys to death, hell, and the grave for us? I think so. And I don't think it's a jump to really put that together. Going back to Acts chapter 3, verse 15, the notes in my Bible show something very interesting there in verse 15. Verse 15 says, and he killed the prince of life. In my Bible, it says that that word prince can also be translated as author. Building a bridge from the Old Testament to the New Testament, let's go to Genesis 1.1. Anybody want to quote it? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. All right. Well, let's see a parallel. In John chapter 1, let's start at verse 1. In the beginning, interesting, was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Wow. What an amazing parallel that we find in Scripture. That passage can seem confusing. I'll admit it. It is justifiably confusing if you don't have the key to the revelation of the verse. But guess what? You don't have to have a scholarly degree. God is so wonderful because he, while he uses John 1, 1 through 3 to remind us of creation, he also includes the key to understanding his multifaceted manifestational relationship with us, just a few verses down, this, the word was God, the word was with God. All right, well, who is this word? Let's jump down to verse 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now tell me, who else can that be but Jesus Christ? There is no other answer. That has to be Jesus Christ. So if that's the word, then nothing else was made but what was made by him. That had to be God. So Jesus is God. Looking back at Genesis through the lens of John 1, you see Jesus truly being the definition of the creator. The prince of life that's talked about in Acts chapter 3 verse 15 or the author of life. The answer jumps off the page to speak to us, to show us that Jesus is Jehovah. When seeing that verse, you might key into the word begotten. We can practically quote the verse using begotten, another scripture reference that we remember, a lot of us do remember learning early on in Sunday school somewhere, also found in John. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Thank you, Jesus, for being the only begotten son. 
The great thing is that there are no shortages of the verses try, tying Jesus back to the Old Testament. And just a span of five verses that we've discovered, we've discussed, we have seen the creation and the begotten Son of the Father. Looking at those passages of John 1 and John 3 we just read, we can't help but see the parallels in another verse. But this time it goes back a couple hundred years to the Old Testament. In the season of Christmas we're about to enter, we often read Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, mm, the Prince of Peace. Again, we see the Son given. We see the mention of the Father. God's role as the Father ties directly back to both Genesis 1 and John 1 because by creation he is indeed the Father of all. But let's not gloss over the important connection made not just between these passes that are separated by hundreds of years, but right in the very same verse, right before our eyes, we see that the Son is the Father. For unto us a child is born, a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. If he is not God, how can the Son be the Everlasting Father? Again, that's not a one in purpose type thing. We also have some other beautiful titles or modes of God written there. Wonderful. Counselor. The Prince of Peace. The Mighty God. The Mighty God. Hmm. With all those other descriptions of the Mighty God, I'm compelled forward back into the New Testament. Forward to Colossians chapter 2, starting at verse 8, where it says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Paul is talking about the only begotten son here. But the very next verse is where we see he was not only describing that particular mode or manifestation of God, because in verse 9, he says, For in him, Jesus Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Wonderful. Counselor, the mighty God, the Prince of Peace, and let's never forget the everlasting Father. Paul puts a nice bow on top of that and drives it home in verse 10. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all peculiarity and power. Sorry, I'm supposed to be teaching, but you get to talking about doctrine like this, and you can't help it. With that in mind, we need to go back to what's in Scripture and not man-made. Let's dive back into Colossians chapter 2. Let's go back to verse 6. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware, again, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Brothers and sisters, neither the Trinity nor any other multiplicities of the Godhead are in Scripture, literally. The word Trinity literally is not in the Bible, and I'm not trying to hammer down on it. I'm just drawing a comparison to the largest part of that, the belief in the Godhead outside of the truth. The word's not in there. That's because it wasn't brought up until well over 100 years after Jesus' death. It was not made a truly major thing in Christianity until 292 years after Jesus' death. That's why it's so important to die, tie verses like Isaiah 9, 6 to Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. While we're here, we might as well daisy chain from Colossians chapter 2 to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, where it says, There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in the hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Take a guess as to how he is in you all. 
I'd like to close my lesson today with this very interesting bridge from the Old Testament that ties to the New Testament. In Isaiah 43.3, it says, For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, just like Acts chapter 3, thy Savior. I gave Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopia, and Seba for three, for thee. <laughs> we see it again in Isaiah 47.4. As for our Redeemer, the Lord of hosts is his name, the Holy One of Israel. In addition to Jehovah or Yahweh, there are some other names of God from the Old Testament that are special and signify only God is God. One of those is El Hakadosh. In fact, the word Holy One of Israel, that's what El Hakadosh means. Another name is El Yeshua. El Yeshua means God of my salvation because God, Yeshua means salvation and El is a prefix meaning God. In Isaiah starting in chapter 12 verse 2, it says, Behold, God is my salvation. The word there is Yeshua. I will trust and not be afraid for the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He has also become my salvation. Yeshua, again. Therefore, with joy shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation. In verse 3, again, that word is Yeshua. And in the day that shall ye say, praise the Lord, call upon his name, declare his doings among the people, make mention that his name is exalted. Sing unto the Lord, for he hath done excellent things. This is known in all the earth. Cry out and shout, thou inhabitant of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel, El Hakadosh, in the midst of thee. Now let's jump into the New Testament. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus translated in the Greek is Jesus. Pronounced phonetically, Jesus. Jesus translated in Hebrew is Lucas. What's that? Yeshua. Yeshua translate as, translates as salvation or deliverer. But you piece it together with El Yeshua and it becomes Jehovah has become my salvation. Let's go back to Isaiah chapter 12 and read it again with a new non-message version translation. Behold, Jehovah is Jesus. I will trust and not be afraid, for the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also is become Jesus. Continuing down the chapter, let's apply what we just learned. Therefore, with joy shall ye draw water out of the wells of Jesus. And in that day shall ye say, praise the Lord, call upon his name, declare his doings among the people, make mention that his name is exalted, sing unto the Lord, for he hath done excellent things. This is known in all the earth. Cry out and shout, thou inhabitant of Zion, for great is the Holy One, El Hakadosh, in the midst of thee. Let's tie these references from Isaiah with the New Testament one last time. We've actually briefly touched on it already. Mark 1, 24, where the, the account of the, the uh, possessed man. And Acts chapter 3, verse 14, we read and talked about. Both use the, the phrase, holy one. Here's another scripture reference with that title. It's the same account as Mark, but in Luke. It's Luke's version of what we read in Mark 1, 24. Luke 4, 33 through 34 says, And in the synagogue there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil and cried out, with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. If it was in Hebrew, that would be El Hakadosh. Again, we see that title, Holy One. In both Mark 1, 24 and Luke 4, 33 through 34, we see the account of a demon-possessed man crying out to Jesus. The amazing and interesting thing that to remember is that demons are fallen angels. It is said in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, in the year of King Uzziah died, I saw 
also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted it up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet. With twain he did fly. An angel. Verse 3. And cried one to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. In both accounts found in Luke and Mark, we see the fallen angel that recognized the only one in all eternity worthy of being called the Holy One. Therein lies the beauty of Scripture as we can see it, a, a direct correlation between those three New Testament references of Acts chapter 3, verse 14, Mark 1, 24, and Luke 34, 33 through 34, all correlating back to the Old Testament. Jesus is indeed God manifested in the flesh. Next week, I'll finish up speaking on the oneness of God and set up the rest of the series and everything. The series is going to be awesome. We're going to talk about the wheel of prophecy, and we'll really dive in and show. It's going to be up there on the, on the screen. If you've never heard of the wheel of prophecy, it's, it's revelatory. It's one of my favorite uh, examples and, and things that you can use and tools that you have at your hand to be able to look at the corresponding verses and everything and see how Jesus is this. Well, Jesus is I am, and then it says God is I am, showing you all the correlating scriptures and everything. It's going to be awesome. Um, but that is my lesson for today. I hope you gleaned something from it. If not, it was fun because <laughs> I like talking about oneness, man. It's good stuff. Um, we're going to go ahead and get this place ready spiritually for God to move.